Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Happy March. With the change of new, uh, the new month, um, it kind of caught up on us, and I did not get a chance to update some of the monthly tasks in the bulletin. So just because it says who is serving today might not be as accurate as. Um, as it's printed, but next Sunday it will be all updated um, and whatnot. So um, thank you for all of you who serve, whether your name is printed in the bulletin or not. We are so grateful for that. Lots of things going on um, in the coming months. Um, one of them is um, Holy Week services that are happening at Trinity Lutheran Church in Galesburg. And Sharon is going to share with us some information about that. Uh, this is the 100th year of the uh, Holy Week services at Trinity. And I just wanted to let you know that on Good Friday, our bishop, uh, Stacy Fiddler, will be the last word. And I thought um, you might be interested in going on Good Friday to hear Stacy. And the last word is usually around 3? Almost 2.30 to 3. 2.30 to 3, because the way they do it is half-hour segments all throughout the afternoon. Um, and you, you come and go as your schedule allows. Some people stay for the entire afternoon, but oftentimes you go, you because um, it's usually uh, Song, a reading, um, sermon, prayer, song, and then quiet time until the next half hour. So, um, um, and that it's been going on for a century of this ecumenical partnership. It's really something to celebrate. And we have been part of that partnership. I'm not sure when we started the partnership, but I know since I've been here, I've participated in it almost every year. So. Um, I encourage you to do so. Um, are there any other community announcements or concerns we need to be made aware of? Choir will meet after. Yes, coffee. choir is meeting afterwards, um, after coffee. With that, let us begin our worship this morning as we confess our need for God. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Holy God, we, we confess, confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things, and for sins only you know, forgive us, Lord. Amen. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrong, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is 19. Let's read it responsibly. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired by they than gold, more than much fine gold, 
sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from, from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The second reading is from the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Jesus. 
Jesus came into the temple and there were cows and goats and sheep and all kinds of things. And they were selling them. It was like a big flea market. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Don't make my temple a flea market. And he turned over the table where they were collecting money and he shoot all the animals out of there. And he said, my temple is the house of God and it's not a marketplace. Well, during Lent, it's a good time for us to remember that we need to do some cleaning too. Sometimes we need to clean our hearts and make us more giving and loving and caring. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to clean our hearts during this Lent. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. In the Gospel today, Jesus discovers that the temple has been turned from a place of worship into a marketplace. The predominance of selling animals and the exchanging of money for profit overshadow what is supposed to be the main activity in the temple, which is worshiping God. The vendors and the money changers seem to be more interested in serving their own interests and greedily filling up their purses with coins than in serving God and God's people. Instead of helping people worship God, they're getting in the way. The commercialization of worship means that those who cannot afford the costs are unable to offer their worship to God, and money becomes a God more valued than the God to whom the temple was dedicated. Jesus, of course, finds this situation unacceptable. The first commandment clearly states, you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus will not allow anything especially money, to be given more devotion than God. In addition, Jesus' Jesus's purpose in coming to earth was to take away the barriers between humans and God so that all people might be reconciled to God through him. Now, John's Gospel is unique among the four Gospels, usually you hear about Jesus um, having this exchange in the temple during Holy Week. But in John's Gospel, it happens at the beginning rather than the end of Jesus' ministry. Now this placement shows how John's Gospel emphasizes that Jesus has come to replace the temple. No longer will God's presence be confined to a place, the temple, but instead, God's presence is now embodied in the person of Jesus. Jesus welcomed all to him and erects no barriers or limits on who can be his follower. And that's why we worship and why we come as we are knowing there is no barrier that keeps us from worshiping God. Now, when I was in seminary, I had an opportunity to take a class called Expressing the Gospel Through Poetry and Drama. And we would take movies and literature and see how the gospel was enacted um, and where good news could be proclaimed in places that you might not expect. Especially we dissected a lot of Shakespeare. Um, we um, actually took a field trip to Canada to, um, it, it was a Shakespeare festival, um, a Stratford, um, I'm not remembering exactly, but there is a festival in Canada that all week long they do um, Shakespeare and drama and plays and it 
it was such a unique experience to be able to um, see, even in works of fiction, how truths can be told. Now today, I'm taking a leap of faith because I have a dramatization that I'm going to, to share with you. Um, it is a, a creative part of this, and so I don't want you all to think, oh, that this is 100% factual. It is certainly um, a creative, um, a, a, a cre creative license has been taken, but truth is spoken through there. And so, in just a few moments, I am not going to be Pastor Katie. I am going to be one of the Dove Sellers. And through this first person creative account, um, I encourage you to hear where you see hints of God in acting um, and where you might be convicted of where in your lives or your attitudes that, that might be to change and how our gospel and how we live um, affects your life and how the Holy Spirit speaks to you through this. So, with no further ado, I introduce to you the Dove Seller. It is a characterization of one of the Dove Sellers of the Temple, and it was written by a colleague of mine, Sarah Fogler, and she has encouraged us to use this um, and uh, greatly with no copyright, well, yes, it's copyrighted to her, but she is letting us use this freely without us having to, um, to pay her for this use. So thank you, Sarah. The Dove Seller. I'm trying to understand what happened. I'm trying to make sense of what Jesus of Nazareth did. Now my next door neighbor says, it's all about time somebody did something about the corruption in Jerusalem. But as far as I'm concerned, what Jesus did is just plain crazy. And honestly, what's the big deal here? It's Passover. Every faithful Jew in the region is expected by law to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. But Jews from all over the world come too. This place is mobbed. Now, everyone who comes to the temple is required to pay a temple tax. And it must be paid in sanctuary shekels. Forbidden co or foreign coins are unclean. It may be all right to pay other debts with foreign coin, but the debt to God must be paid in coins that are blessed. Only temple shekels are pure enough for a temple tax. Jesus must know this. And how are people supposed to pay their temple tax if they can't exchange the coins that they are bringing from Rome and Egypt and Greece? This is the way it's always been. Doesn't Jesus know that? In my opinion, he is being unreasonably judgmental and demanding. The money changers are providing a service. Of course, they charge a lot of money for this, but that's what's to be expected, isn't it? I've heard people complain about what a hardship this is. Most Jews are poor. Of course it's a hardship, but life is hard. And I don't make the rules. I can't change the rules. If Jesus thinks he's going to storm in here and change the rules, he's got another thing coming. I've heard people complain that the temple is rich. They have millions of drachmas. Why do they need so much money, people say. They have a point, but I'm no priest. I don't know what they do with all that money. I'm a simple seller of doves. I just do my job and stay out of politics. And if Jesus knows what's good for him, he'll stay out of politics too. I've heard people complain that the 
money changers, and the animal sellers that were greedy. But we're just trying to make a living. You can see that, can't you? Every Jew who comes to Jerusalem at Passover wants to offer a sacrifice to God, a thank offering. As a dove seller in the temple court, I provide an easy way to do that. You may think it's a racket. I say it's just making the most out of an opportunity. Here's how it works. We have special sacrifice inspectors, and if an animal is brought in from the outside of the temple, if it's impure in any way, it is unacceptable. Now, we all chip in to make sure that the inspector will reject any animal from the outside so that they'll have to buy them from here in the temple. Of course, any animal we sell will always pass inspection. Sweet, don't you think? Let's just say, if you want to make it in this business, it's important to have a good working arrangement with the right people. I realize that a pair of unblemished doves can be purchased for much less on the outskirts of town. I charge 12 times as much, or more, but every dove seller in the temple does the same thing. And our markup is not as high as the sheep or the cattle sellers at the temple. And you have to remember how much trouble we all spare the pilgrims who come to the temple. They don't have to transport any animal it's not easy to carry animals around. Not having to bring animals all the way to the temple is worth something, isn't it? Maybe it's not worth as much as we charge, but like I said, I did to create this arrangement. I'm just working with it. I didn't create the system. I'm just trying to make the most of it. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? It's not as if my big goal in life is to exploit poor people. I'm just here trying to make a living, like everybody else. The temple is big business. Why should I get my cut? Jesus can rant and rave all he wants about how God's temple is supposed to be a house of prayer and not a public market. But can't it be both? What's wrong with that? Jesus, but I hadn't heard that he could be so angry. I tell you, that fanatic from Nazareth had a whip in his hands and was racing through the outer courts of the temple, cracking that whip and shouting and turning the tables upside down. He was trying to clear out the money changers and all the other merchants. He yelled at us. The dog sellers, insisting that we get all these things out of the temple. I hope he's not like those prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea, who think we should do away with sacrifices. It's not good for business. Let me tell you something. People like sacrifices. It's much less trouble to sacrifice some poor animal to God than to sacrifice something more personal, like the way you're living, or a grudge you're holding. In the long run, it's a lot less expensive to buy a couple of my dear doves than to change your life. Does Jesus think he's going to revolutionize the way we make amends with God? I'm not sure that I've ever seen anyone so angry my neighbor says it was passion, but make no mistake about it, he was angry. His rage was large enough for all Jerusalem, and by now all Jerusalem has heard about it. Who does he think he is? God? <laughs> the man needs to get a grip or he's going to end up like the dove's eyes. After the episode at the temple, some people confronted him. Not me. I tried to stay out of the fray. 
I mind my business, you mind your business, and that's what works for me. But some people took him on. They asked him, how can he possibly justify his actions? We've all heard the rumor that he can perform miracles. Why, I heard he can turn water into wine. <laughs> That's a useful trick. So they asked him for a miracle as a way of proving he was really carrying, carrying out God's wishes and creating such a stir at the temple. Well, he didn't do anything, but he had some big talk. He said, you destroyed this temple and all resurrected in three days. What's that supposed to mean? Did he think we're going to knock down the temple just so he could prove that he could perform a miracle? Huh. I want Jesus and his judgments out of here. I want him to leave me alone. If he thinks he's going to get me to turn my life upside down, just like he did the tables of the money changers, he needs to think again. Could I be a better person? Of course I could. Could the temple be more like a house of prayer? Of course it could. Could the world use a few improvements? Well, you catch my meaning. I'm doing the best I can. Well, maybe I'm not doing the best I can, but I'm not a murderer. I'm not an adulterer. I cheat a little here and there. What's the difference? I guess I don't want to understand what Jesus was doing or what he meant with all that talk about the temple. I don't want to change. I don't have to change. I don't want to worry about being fair to the poor. I don't want to worry about corruption. I have enough worries of my own. And if Jesus doesn't watch out, well, let's just say he's the one who should be worried. Keep your eye on him. He's a very demanding character. And he's in for trouble. Please rise as we sing our hymn of the day.
say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. You alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken the church to the mystery of your presence, and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of your deliverance. In our con congregational prayers for today, we especially pray for Megan and Lillian Halls. Strengthen their faith so they may continue the ministry you have called them to. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You renew creation. Drive out those who would make the earth a marketplace. Protect rainforests, mountaintops, ocean, and wilderness areas from commercial exploitation. Unite nations, policymakers, and businesses in efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You judge the nations. We pray for an end to war and strife in every land. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing from conflict, especially in Gaza. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You bring healing and hope. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, and public health workers who prevent and treat illness. We pray for any who are sick, especially we pray for Jeanette, Linda, Chuck, Jeremy, Nancy, Ted, Doreen, Merv, John, and Kate. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You abide with your people. Sustain any in this community undergoing life transitions. Marriage, divorce, childbirth, adoption, moving, graduation, employment change, or a death in the family. We pray for those preparing for baptism. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. You bring life from death. We remember our loved ones who have died, confident that they have new life in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your love. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us take a moment and share God's peace with those around us. God's peace be with you all. Our giving is an act of worship, and at this time we receive our offering.
Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
through the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. You may go in peace. Please rise. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Amen. What joys and celebrations do we have today? We have birthday this week on Tuesday, Karen Steph. <laughs> Let's see. I don't have anything else. Now, Andrew and Trace had solo and ensemble this week, and I hear they both did pretty good. So um, we're very proud of them. And um, also, Heidi heard from the um, head of the music department at Northern Michigan University, and the faculty have um, voted and have um, given her the honor of uh, top music educator graduating from this year. So, um, so that is, we're really pleased. That graduation for her will be coming before we know it. It is May 4th. So um, we're just really pleased. That is um, a, quite a, an honor to be, to be given. So. Um, Sing it, Karen. Yes, Karen. This one's for you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Karen. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. <laughs> Friends, receive your blessing. Beloved, we are God's own people. Holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen.